This is CBN News Watch. And thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. We want to begin this half hour with the fourth day of the ceasefire between Hamas and Israel and the ongoing release of hostages kidnapped on October 7th. As Chris Mitchell reports now from Jerusalem, the ceasefire may be extended much longer to release more hostages. For the past three days, heartwarming scenes have played out here in Israel as families are being reunited after weeks of captivity since being kidnapped by Hamas. 14 Israelis were released on Sunday, including four-year-old Abigail Idan, an Israeli-American. Hamas killed her parents in front of her during the massacre on October 7th. I just spoke with President Biden with great excitement, of course, also about the little girl, Abigail. What a joy to see her with us. But on the other hand, what a pity that she returns to the reality of not having parents. She has no parents, but she has a whole nation that embraces her and we will take care of all her needs. President Joe Biden took a direct interest in Abigail. Though intensive U.S. diplomacy, she's now safely in Israel. And we continue to press and expect for additional Americans will be released as well. And we will not stop working until every hostage is returned to their loved ones. So far, 40 Israelis have been freed, with more expected today for at least a total of 50. In Jerusalem and the West Bank, Palestinians celebrated the return of dozens of prisoners released in exchange for the hostages. Many of them committed attempted murder, stabbing, shootings, or through Molotov cocktails. This Palestinian woman called for more kidnappings so more prisoners could be freed. It's likely more Palestinian prisoners and Israeli hostages will be released today. Israel's war cabinet is deciding whether or not to extend the ceasefire for up to 10 more days, with 10 hostages released for each day. That could prolong Israel's military campaign as much as two weeks. I think every day that goes on with the ceasefire, it's going to be harder for them to restart the war machine. And that is exactly what Hamas intends. They understand that the longer this ceasefire goes on, the more pressure will build on Israel to continue that ceasefire indefinitely. And if they continue it indefinitely, then Hamas does not get wiped out and Hamas survives. That's, the, that's their, their strategy here, I believe. Despite the delay, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu visited IDF troops in Gaza and pledged total victory. We're here in the Gaza Strip with our heroic fighters. We're making every effort to return our hostages, and at the end of the day, we will return everyone. We have three goals in this war. Eliminate Hamas, return all our hostages, and ensure that Gaza does not return to be a threat to the state of Israel again. I want to continue our coverage now with Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell. So, Chris, uh, as more hostages are being released, what kind of support are they getting after returning, especially like a four-year-old child, Abigail, whose parents were killed during that October 7th massacre? Well, Ephraim, first of all, they're getting medical help and examination. That's probably the first thing they're doing to see how they're doing. They're also getting counseling, uh, and that may last a while. You just think of the trauma. As you mentioned, a four-year-old girl, Abigail, she was taken from her home. Her parents were murdered. And then on the other hand, take uh, an 84-year-old uh, Israeli, Alma Avaram. She went immediately to the hospital for a life-threatening condition as soon as she was released. So everyone here in, uh, this, of these hostages has a traumatic story, some more dramatic than others, but each one is just traumatized by taking uh, captive there on October 7th. So it's going to be a long-term process to get back to normal life if there'll ever be a normal life for any of these hostages. Now, this is day four of the ceasefire, both sides considering extending. What does that process look like? Well, the process looks like that right now. For every 10 hostages, the ceasefire, which has gone four days now, will be extended by a day. And then for every hostage, three Palestinian prisoners would be released. Uh, President Biden has already said that he wants to extend the ceasefire. So it's likely it's going to continue. Uh, but for many here, Ephraim and Israel, they're very leery about this deal. 
It really puts Hamas in control of the war, which is, as Chuck Holton said in our report, it's exactly where they want to be. But it looks right now that it could be extended by another 10 days. That would be another 100 hostages. Uh, still, that would remain maybe, uh, let's see, about 100 hostages remaining. So this could go on a long time, and that's exactly what Hamas would like to do. Now, of course, the world watching this from a distance, but how are some of the citizens in Israel feeling about the ceasefire? Well, you know, uh, the way I've been talking to Israelis, uh, Ephraim, uh, here's a quote from an, uh, an Israeli I interviewed right here in our studio earlier today. No one's happy with this deal. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, everybody's happy with the return of any of the hostages. But the question is, at what cost? Uh, this, for one, puts the IDF at risk, and as Chuck Colton said, it really puts a stop to the war machine that Israel had been fighting Hamas for several weeks. And then the question is, will the war be put off indefinitely? And uh, as Michael Oren said, the uh, former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., will Hamas get away from murder? He also said this, uh, uh, that Israelis are really battling between their soul and their body. On the one hand, uh, Israelis feel like they must rescue all of the hostages at all costs. On the other hand, they want to save the state of Israel so because they, they can't allow uh, Hamas to exist on their southern border. So it's really a nightmarish dilemma for Israelis and especially for those uh, leaders, both political and military, that are making these historic decisions. Another development following is this news that the U.S. Navy has taken back control of an Israel-affiliated affili tanker. What can you tell us about that? Well, the U.S. Navy put, uh, uh, put reclaimed a, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's called the USS uh, Mason, managed to catch up with a um, uh, hostage that was taken, taken by uh, by the Yemenis, by the Houthis, and then it was the latest attempt by the Houthis to disrupt shipping in the Red Sea off the coast of Yemen. And so the Houthis actually launched two ballistic missiles at the USS Mason. That was the Navy ship that went back and got that particular tanker. But both those missiles fell into the sea. And what this is, probably, uh, Ephraim, is an attempt by the Houthis to really disrupt uh, the sea lanes there in the Red Sea and off the coast of Yemen. In effect, some people say almost have it like a, you know, a uh, <clears throat> naval blockade on Israel. Mm. Got less than a minute ago, but before we let you go, are there any plans for another prayer gathering in Israel this week? Yeah, this week, uh, Ephraim, on Wednesday, there's going to be a prayer meeting at Israel's parliament, the Knesset. Christians or Jews are going to be gathering to pray for Israel, protection for the soldiers, wisdom for the government. And also on that day, there's a global African prayer movement uh, on Wednesday. And Wednesday is the anniversary of the November 29th UN vote for a Jewish state. And so many people are feeling, Ephraim, this is really an existential situation for Israel, surrounded by enemies, exponential rise of anti-Semitism. So where can they look for? They need to look up. Many people are looking at Psalm 121 that says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Much needed prayer, Chris Mitchell, our Bureau Chief. Uh, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Back here in the United States, Democrats continue to battle inside their party over the correct U.S. policy on Israel, with liberals wanting to set conditions on any new military aid. Adil Hurd is on this story. Leading Democrats in the party's progressive wing are warning they'll oppose a $14 billion White House aid package to Israel if it does not put constraints on how the Israeli Defense Forces fight Hamas. The divide among Democrats is said to be driven not only by Arab American and Muslim voters, but by the generational split that has younger Democrats more opposed to helping Israel. In the New York Times, Senator Bernie Sanders wrote, the United States must make clear that while we are friends of Israel, there are conditions to that friendship, and that we cannot be complicit in actions that violate international law and our own sense of decency. Sanders wants an end to what he calls indiscriminate bombing, a significant pause in the fighting to allow more humanitarian assistance for the Palestinians, even allowing them to return to their homes. No long-term Israeli occupation of Gaza, an end to settler violence in the West Bank, and a freeze on settlement expansion. Sanders has been calling for restraint by the Israeli military ever since the Hamas attack. But while we do our best to support Israel and destroy Hamas, please, 
Let us not turn our back on the suffering people in Gaza. The question will be what exactly are the conditions for aid that are laid down by progressives and how many members of Congress will support them. While President Biden suggested putting conditions on aid to Israel might be a good idea, it took diplomacy to achieve the release of the hostages. Well, I think that's a, 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 a worthwhile thought, but I don't think if I started off with that, we'd ever gotten to where we are today. House day. Intelligence we Committee really Chairman Republican so Congressman Mike Turner on NBC's Meet the Press was not sounding as if he would oppose putting some conditions on USA to Israel. I wouldn't propose it, but I think it does accurately reflect U.S. policy. But while some in Congress may support restrictions on aid, the far left wing of the Democratic Party may push for more than most members will accept. The demands by progressives have not only sparked an intra-party conflict with pro-Israel Democrats, they threaten an aid package that now only has a short window for passage before year's end. Dale Hurd, CBN News. An American who's been supporting Jews in the West Bank while living there for 20 years. He's going to reveal the truth about Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria and share how support for Hamas is putting them in even greater danger. Stay with us. You're watching CBN Newswatch. Download the CBN News app, 24-7 News, from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. Amid the fighting in Gaza, there have also been clashes in the area known as the West Bank, the biblical Judea and Samaria, including violent protests and gun battles during Israeli arrest raids. Despite concerns over the area, one Christian organization is committed to standing with the Israeli settlers no matter what. Chuck Holton brings us that story now from Judea. Ha Yovel operates deep in the hills of Judea and Samaria the biblical heartland, also known as the West Bank. In addition to biblical history, the area is also steeped in modern conflict. While much of the world believes Jewish communities here undermine the peace process, one group of Americans has been living in Samaria since 2004. Our family came here uh, 20 years ago. Uh, we uh, came here to, to support the, the Jews in their return to the, in, in their biblical mandate, prophetic mandate, and we're excited to be serving them. Hayovel volunteers say they simply support Jewish settlers who have a right to be here based on biblical history. Now, threats to their existence are greater than ever. October 7th gave us a uh, wake-up call. I think it gave all of Israel a wake-up call. But, but here for us, this is the first time we've, we've actually seen a multi-front war since 1973. So our purpose here is to serve these communities who are vulnerable. Bottom line, they're vulnerable, and, and I think the Christian world needs to understand that. So this is the gate that goes from Israel into N the city of Nablus, which is an Israeli city, but it's uh, administered by the Palestinians. Under the Oslo Accords, there were three zones, A zone, B zone, and C zone. A zone is a zone where Israelis are not allowed to go. It's administered by the Palestinian Authority, and you can see this sign here which shows this road leads to an Area A under the Palestinian Authority, and it is illegal for Israeli citizens to enter this area. Why? Because it is dangerous to your lives. Now, Arabs can pass through this gate and come through to Israeli-controlled areas without any problems. And in fact, tens of thousands of them do that every day to go to work. But right now, they're not able to go to work because of what happened on October 7th. The whole idea of apartheid state is a bunch of bunk. It's leftist propaganda that's trying to steal uh, this biblical lands from Israel. And the uh, signs that you mentioned, these big red signs, there's no sign, there's no place in all of Israel that says no Arabs allowed. This just doesn't exist. As an Israeli in this area, you would not be able to go to the Arab village next door. Like it's no Jews allowed. On the other hand, the Jewish settlement behind me 
this Jewish settlement. Guess who built all those apartment buildings? The Arabs. They, they hired Arabs to come and build these communities. With tensions already high, the Palestinian Authority leaders calling for a repeat of October 7th, global calls to support Hamas put people here in danger. So we've got 500,000 Jewish people living in this Judea and Samaria area, all of which are surrounded by these hostile Arab villages. We can talk about the percentages, but the facts on the ground are there's enough hostility in these towns to cause a major threat to these Jewish communities living here. Just the other day, right after October 7th, we saw the flags of Hamas flying in the nearby village. But this family has no plans to evacuate. There's never been a line uh, that's so clear. Evil has never been so clear to us. So this is not, not even a question for anybody in our family. Uh, we're, we're standing with the Jewish people. From Samaria, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Still ahead, how one church in North Carolina is on a mission to plant 1,000 churches. Stay with us. You're watching CBN News Watch. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. U.S. churches are closing at an alarming rate. About 4,500 Protestant churches closed in 2019. That is the most recent year on record. And experts believe the closures were accelerated by the pandemic. One church family has made it its mission to offset this trend with a goal of planting 1,000 churches in our generation. CBN's Brody Carter reports from the Carolinas. Every demographic study that I've seen of recent shows that the, the group that is growing maybe the fastest, you know, one of the fastest at least, is this N-O-N-E group, the nuns, and um, they, they're no longer, they're very skeptical of institutionalized religion. One of the things we can get wrong is to think that they're not interested in spirituality. J.D. Greer should know, as he served as the Southern Baptist Convention president from 2018 to 2021. At its peak, the denomination grew to more than 16 million members in some 48,000 churches nationwide. Since then, a slow yet steady decline has stripped away more than 3 million of its members. Honestly, probably we're not practicing believers anyway, but they, them and then their descendants are dropping out. Some may connect this decline to internal divisions over LGBTQ rights, a sex abuse scandal, and the question over females serving as pastors. A lot of the decline in, in those numbers is just, it's cultural Christianity. But if you actually look at the statistics on the amount of, of what I would consider true disciples, those numbers are actually encouraging. Today, Greer focuses on his own ministry in Durham, North Carolina, as pastor at the Summit Church which has seen massive growth despite uncertainty in the SBC. Because of the empty tomb, our road doesn't end at the grave. If anything, it begins there for those who are in Christ. What we're after here is not demographic increase. What we're after is real followers of Jesus. To date, the Summit Church has strategically planted 75 North American churches in metropolitan cities and college towns, with more than 500 planted worldwide. Their mission is to supply these communities with a church that can proclaim and live out the gospel. Unfortunately, a lot of them are not reached um, in the church by just doing you know, great music, great guest services, and relevant sermons. A lot of them have to be reached outside the church, which means that we have to equip our members to carry the gospel outside the walls of the church. That's always been important, but it's more important than ever. Charleston Baptist Association is 270 years old and growing. Harbor Church is one of the newest additions thanks to J.D. Greer Ministries. My desire was to be used by God in my generation to be able to share the hope of the gospel in an area of need, and I found that in Charleston. Summit sent church planter Jonathan Lenker to start Harbor City Church in Charleston, South Carolina. We came here with 35 people as a part of a launch team. We grew to about 60 and then went public on, in September 18th of 2022. Um, we've since grown. Last weekend, we had 201 people here at our service. Since the 1700s, Charleston has been known as the holy city for its religious tolerance, boasting some 400 churches. Lanker, however, feels that title has lost its meaning over time. If you talk to someone who really knows the city, you'll understand that most of those churches are empty on a Sunday. The, the ultimate vision, like we will know that we fulfilled our mission, is to see the holy city holy in truth and not just in name. While the gospel remains the same, 
people and culture do not. This is why Greer and his network plant churches to reach new generations and help them grow. God has given the church one commission. Uh, Jesus' great commission only has one verb in it. Uh, we don't see that in English because it looks like a bunch of verbs, but the only verb is make disciples. Everything else he says in there is a participle, which means it strengthens or, or amplifies the verb. Um, the commission that God gives to the church in every generation is make disciples. Coming up, holiday fun around the nation, and we're going to take you to one in New Hampshire. Plus, we've got your Monday motivation. It's all coming up next. Stay with us. Introducing a brand new way to start your morning. Get your daily quick start from CBN News. A quick read on the important news of the day delivered right to your inbox. Stay current on breaking news, politics, and entertainment. Discover how God is moving around the world and here at home. Plus, get exclusive stories and daily scripture encouragement just for you. Stay informed. Go to quickstart.news and subscribe today. Holiday season is upon us, and of course, we are looking for festive events to encounter. Well, one place is in New Hampshire. It kicked off its holiday ventures over the weekend with its annual holiday stroll. The stroll was filled with lots of families who got to enjoy carnivals, games, and various food, live performances, and a beautiful tree lighting. With that, it is time now for your Monday Motivation. Today, I want to leave you with this thought as we begin another week together. We've all got wounds. We've all got scars. And those battle scars aren't usually attractive. What they are, though, is a daily reminder of healing. And with healing comes harvest. Wound scars harvest. It's a great day to look at those scars, celebrate your healing, and enjoy the harvest. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News. Watch. Remember, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News channel at any time, as well as online. That address is CBNNews.com. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. And, of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly love hearing from you. Make this a marvelous Monday and join us right back here tomorrow. Goodbye. God bless.